Hi, welcome to another physionic detailed study analysis. Today's study analysis is going to be a really fascinating one because it's extremely well controlled and it's extremely peculiar as well. Uh, essentially, you have to ask yourself, what would it be like to be continuously consuming fat? And I mean almost literally straight fat uh, for over 24 hours. What would that do to your health? That's what we're going to be going over. That's what the, these researchers did, which is uh, unique, strange, but uh, obviously offers extreme control over the conditions and really implicates particular fats in these situations. So I'm going to go more into the study design uh, once we get deeper into this analysis. But I wanted to quick mention that f I just recently started the Physionic Insiders, which is a community of like-minded individuals that uh, want to have exclusive content, which is far more targeted and a higher quality content that offers more application and things of that nature, as well as obviously the exclusivity of that content, plus uh, many, many more other benefits as well. Uh, so that's just started uh, about a week ago. Uh, if you're interested in supporting me and my work and you want to have access to all of the exclusive content that comes out, which is going to be uh, a growing library of things, then I would highly recommend that you check it out. Uh, I'll post a card and uh, at the end of this uh, episode, I'll uh, remind you once again. Now, when this releases, I'm also going to have a piece of content that's specific to the topic at hand. So discussing saturated fat, unsaturated fats, poly and monounsaturated fats, as well as carbohydrates. So I'm going to have a uh, exclusive piece of content wherein I analyze a meta-analysis, which is a grouping of, in this situation, over 100 studies. So a group of researchers uh, decided to look at all of the literature that's been done and to find out how monounsaturated fats, saturated fats, polyunsaturated fats, and carbohydrates, how they affect insulin sensitivity. So looking at insulin and blood sugar levels. So this is across over 100 studies. So it's a pretty powerful uh, tool and is going to give us some really interesting results. It's stratified on age. On top of that, it's strat stratified by sex. It's stratified by so many different factors. So I'm really excited to, to present this to the Physionic Insiders. So if you're interested in that, as well as all the other content that's in, in that program, then uh, certainly check it out. Okay, I'm done uh, advertising. Now, uh, if you're not familiar with who I am, my name is Nicholas Verhoeven. I'm a uh, PhD candidate in molecular medicine, and I have a serious passion for reading research. So. Uh, that's what we're going to be doing in this episode. We're going to be discussing a real detailed breakdown of how varying fats, a little bit like what the meta-analysis does, but this is just one study. The meta-analysis is going to be looking at over 100. Uh, this study looks at how varying fats affect our insulin sensitivity. So without further ado, let's go ahead and, and jump into that. So the question, as I mentioned, uh, how does continuous exposure, and this is really, truly continuous exposure to saturated fat, monounsaturated fat, and polyunsaturated fat, how do, that, how do those affect uh, insulin sensitivity? Uh, the research that we're going to be going over is going to be coming from this study, uh, differential effects of monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, and saturated fat ingestion on glucose-stimulated insulin secretion, sensitivity, and clearance in overweight and obese non-diabetic humans. So uh, that's a, quite a mouthful, as most study titles tend to be. But uh, don't worry, you know, I'll, I'll break it down with you. All right, so like I said, this is pretty unique in the way that they did this. They recruited seven overweight but otherwise healthy, as in they tested for diabetes markers and things of that nature, cardiometabolic markers, and they found that these individuals were, albeit even though some of them were extremely overweight, uh, they were still considered healthy. They didn't have any uh, dyslipidemia or anything like that. 
So they recruited these seven individuals and they had them come into the lab on four separate occasions. On each of those occasions, they were then instructed to consume every hour for 12 hours and then I think every two hours, yes, every hour for 12 hours. And then from after that, for the remaining 12 to 16 hours, every two hours, one of four conditions. So they were instructed to consume a chocolate fa flavored drink. That's why these are, I have a label that made all these brown. Uh, a chocolate flavored drink that contained either m a heavy monounsaturated fat drink or like a combination, polyunsaturated fat drink or saturated fat drink. And then the fourth condition was the control, which was just water. And inside, the, what was actually in those drinks, so I've labeled them as monounsaturated, polyunsaturated. It's not like they, they were completely monounsaturated or polyunsaturated, but largely, very much strongly uh, to, to be one or the other. So the monounsaturated fat, heavy drink, we'll call it, was 78% monounsaturated fat, 8% poly, and then 14% saturated fat and you can read that across the board for each one of these so polyunsaturated was 78 percent polyunsaturated 13 percent mono and nine percent saturated and then the saturated fat drink had 50 percent saturated and a sizable amount which was uh, monounsaturated fat at 40 percent now the actual drink composition itself was very low carbohydrate nine percent of the drink being carbohydrate 2% protein and 89% fat. So all these percentages of 78%, 8%, 14% that we're looking at here fit into this 89% fat. Now the participants didn't know what they were consuming. They, they just knew they were drinking a chocolate drink, which to be completely honest, let's be real, it probably tasted absolutely horrid, but they had to consume it every hour and they were in a control lab scenario. So the researchers were right there and they were not allowed to consume anything else other than water. So this is the only exposure nutritionally that they were exposed to for over 24 hours. So I'm assuming what they did is they stayed at the lab and I assume that because they had this two hour window, it changed from one hour consumption to two hours. Then from there, the, they were just woken up every two hours and told, hey, drink your drink. It's got to be torturous. And they did this four separate times, as in they, they did one condition, let's say the monounsaturated fat drink. Then they went home for, I think, six weeks or something like that to make sure that there's a huge uh, gap so that everything can go back to, to baseline. And then they would come in again, did the polyunsaturated fat drink, went through this torturous event, and then went home for another, you know, and just continued to do that four different times. It's incredible. Uh, and that's why I've got this 24 hour period. Uh, I think it was up to actually 30 hours. So that's it that we're just literally going to see if you just continuously expose your body to, you know, these heavy fat drinks, mono, poly and saturated fats, what effect that has on insulin sensitivity. So let's look at that data. Okay, so I'm going to, these three graphs are actually linked with one another. And that's because they did a hyperglycemic clamp. That's the experiment that they did. And I've got a, a really simple diagram here of that's, that's going to allow us to understand what that means. So in a hyperglycemic cl clamp, it is as the name implies, hyperglycemic, hyper being way above normal blood sugar levels. And if we measure the glucose levels, they clamp it at around 20. So 20 mil, uh, millimole, which is super, super high. Our normal levels are like four or five millimole. So we're like f over four times the normal amount. So they're actually infusing glucose, which is what I've got here. This is a blood vessel. So, you know, a vein, an artery. And so they're infusing a certain amount of glucose into or sugar into the bloodstream. And they clamp that at 20. 
Then they measure the amount of actual infusion that they have to put into the body. The reason why they do that is because your body already has a certain amount of glucose. And as they add more glucose, then the pancreas is going to have a reaction in that it releases insulin, right? Now that insulin in the bloodstream will then bind to the different cells. Again, this is a really basic diagram, but this is a cell will bind to the cells and allow that sugar into the cells, thereby removing glucose from the bloodstream. But we're measuring the, the blood glucose level, so we're measuring the amount of glucose in the bloodstream. So if the researchers have to start infusing more glucose because the insulin is so effective at removing glucose from the bloodstream, meaning they have to infuse more glucose from outside of the body into the body, that means that there's heightened insulin sensitivity. Now, they also measured the amount of insulin, so they didn't just measure the glucose infusion, so the more infusion, the better, the more insulin sensitive you are, but they also measured the actual amount of insulin that was released. So the best case scenario would be to have low insulin levels or lower insulin levels, have the greatest amount of glucose infusion, because then that means that per molecule of insulin, you're disposing of a lot of glucose into these cells, thereby reducing blood sugar levels. So hopefully I'm doing justice in terms of explaining this, but let's walk through it again. So with the actual data itself. So again, they clamped glucose at 20, so it's not like one condition had more of a benefit than the other. Here we've got our control, we've got our water, got our saturated fat condition, our monounsaturated fat, our polyunsaturated fat, and you're gonna see that consistently. Then here's our glucose infusion, so this is the glucose that they add to the bloodstream. We see the control, and we're comparing against control. What do we see? We see that the saturated fat condition did not have uh, worse or better glucose infusion compared to the control. Monounsaturated fat, same situation. Now you might look at these graphs and say, oh, well, this seems a little bit lower, but statistically speaking, it's not the case. So in these three conditions, they were the same in terms of they infused the same amount of the glucose. The, the researchers had to give the same amount of glucose. Now the polyunsaturated fat condition, as you can see, was significantly increased compared to control. So here we're getting more glucose infusion, which is what I mentioned is a good sign. Um, unless, of course, uh, you have some sort of, of, of problem with, with insulin levels. So here we've got in measures of insulin, we see that we've got a control here and we see that the saturated fat condition has increased insulin secretion, or at least that there's more insulin. It could be insulin secretion, or it could be the removal of insulin. Now, the monounsaturated fat had a slight increase in insulin uh, in the bloodstream as well, and the polyunsaturated fat had an increase in insulin as well that was comparable to the saturated fat. So this is pretty interesting because here we see these increases in insulin. So clearly the pancreas is reacting. Well, most likely the pancreas is reacting and producing insulin. Now that would be expected because uh, in the control condition, you just have water. And then in these conditions, you have these fat conditions with the addition of all this, this uh, glucose that they're adding. So you would expect that there would be some increase in insulin. But What's really interesting is when you compare these two graphs. So saturated fat, you see an increase in insulin secretion, but you don't see a necessary increase in glucose infusion rate. In the monounsaturated fat, you don't see quite as much of an increase in insulin, also you do, although you do see a slight increase, but the glucose infusion stays the same. However, the polyunsaturated fat, sure, there's an equal increase in insulin, as the saturated fat, but you also see an increase in glucose infusion. So if we put all those factors together, so we're looking at them in isolation here, if we look at our next piece of data, this is a combination of all those factors put together uh, into another graph. So here, again, on our vertical axis, we're looking at our glucose infusion rate. So the higher this goes up, obviously, the more glucose is being infused into the bloodstream. On this horizontal axis, 
we're seeing that this is the insulin level. So with increasing insulin levels. So we're trying to find the relationship between insulin levels and glucose infusion. So in our control, we see that we have low insulin levels and we have this standard amount of glucose infusion. With our monounsaturated fat, we see low, relatively low insulin levels, but we see a slightly higher glucose infusion rate. And this is a linear relationship. Because, so from here to here, we've got a linear relationship. This is, uh, you know, indicates that you've got uh, normal insulin sensitivity. Now I'm gonna skip over saturated fat for a second, but polyunsaturated fat, there's an increase. So there's high levels of insulin, but there's also massive, or much greater uh, glucose infusion. So that means that the insulin that is being provided is being used then to shuttle that glucose into the cells. Now, if we focus on saturated fat, however, we get to higher insulin levels, but we see w far lower glucose infusion rates, which means that the insulin is being secreted, it's being pushed out there into the bloodstream, but what insulin is there is leading to fewer glucose molecules or sugar molecules being removed from the bloodstream into the cells. So this is an indication here that the control, the monounsaturated fat and the polyunsaturated fat lead to, at the very least, normal insulin sensitivity. You could argue for better insulin sensitivity and the saturated fat condition leads to dramatically impaired insulin sensitivity. So to walk us through this in conclusion, this study suggests that continuous, and that's really important, continuous exposure to saturated fat, specifically palmitate, reduces insulin sensitivity, while the unsaturated fat, and especially the polyunsaturated fat, increases insulin sensitivity. So, the, to, to give you, I know people are gonna ask me this, so I might as well tell you here before I forget, the basis for the, 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 the fats, the oils that they used for these drinks. So the monounsaturated fat condition was based on olive oil. The polyunsaturated fat was based on saf, safflower oil and the saturated fat was based on palm oil. That's why I uh, wanted to mention specifically that it's palmitate specific saturated fat. If this applies to other saturated fats, we cannot glean that from this information. All right, so hopefully you got something out of this. As I mentioned, if you're interested in joining the, in, uh, the Insiders, Physionic Insiders, I will have separate content on a meta-analysis of over 100 studies looking at this plus the inclusion of carbohydrates and the effect that it has on insulin sensitivity. So as well as much, much more content that's being released on that platform. So if you're interested in supporting me, then uh, I hope that you'll check it out and see for yourself. With that, I'll catch you in the next one.